Welcome to Chautauqua People. My name is John V. My guest today in this first production of the 2015 season is Bill Natchez. Bill is a retired pediatric cardiologist. He did his undergraduate work at Syracuse studying zoology. Thereafter, he went to medical school at SUNY Downstate in Brooklyn and followed that with a residency at uh, Mamadies in Brooklyn under the Berry Plan. He was then called to active military service, served as a major and a pediatrician at Fort Sill, Oklahoma for two years. Following his military commitment, he did a fellowship in pediatric cardiology at Children's Hospital um, in, excuse me, that was a fellowship in uh, pediatric cardiology at Children's Hospital in Texas, and then took a first job, which was basically his career, at Children's Hospital in Pittsburgh, where he began as an assistant professor, rose through the ranks from associate to full professor, ultimately to the division chief uh, of, of cardiology. And he did the full range of work from catheterization to um, lab and, and clinic work. His clinic work brought him to this area, and he became familiar with this community, uh, running clinics in Erie and Bradford. Bill, I understand that you were involved in the first pediatric heart transplant. I wonder if you could tell us about it. Well, that was a very exciting time. I was a pediatric resident, and I knew I wanted to be a pediatric cardiologist. And I was at Maimonides Medical Center in Brooklyn, and they've been doing research for many years about heart transplantation in animals. Um, and we had a child who needed a transplant, and it had never been done before. So we started looking for a baby who would be a donor and actually had uh, uh, sent telegrams out all across the country. And after about four weeks, uh, we found a donor and we brought the baby in, uh, the donor in. Um, and actually our transplant was the first pediatric heart transplant and it was only performed a few days after Christian Barnard did his first transplant in South Africa. So this was a very exciting time to be a budding pediatric cardiologist and um, to be involved with uh, such a prestigious program and to uh, be in the forefront of some new technology. Right. Now, I understand large numbers of children have what's initially thought to be some sort of heart trouble. I wonder if you could tell me what, what's an innocent heart murmur? Well, an innocent heart murmur is a noise that uh, the physician, usually pediatrician or a family practitioner, hears when listening to the child's chest. And about Oh, 90 percent of normal healthy children in the first five years of life at one point or another have an innocent murmur. When children are very small, it's not heard very readily, largely because they're screaming their head off when the pediatrician is listening to them. Mm -hmm. And long about three years of age, when the child starts to be cooperative, uh, the pediatrician often hears this noise, which is nothing more than blood flow um, in the chest and uh, often refers the patient to a pediatric cardiologist for evaluation. Right. Today, how would you evaluate such a patient? Well, we would do the same thing that we have always done, and we would usually, we would always listen to the patient with our stethoscope, and I would say an extraordinarily large percentage of the time, the pediatric cardiologist can actually tell by listening mm -hmm. whether this in, is an innocent murmur or not. And to confirm this, we usually will do at least an electrocardiogram to make sure that that is normal, and a, a basic chest x-ray. Uh, the majority of the time, uh, children with innocent murmurs don't need to have echocardiograms or any other further testing. Right. And so that all is outside, doesn't involve any cutting or any, anything that's... That's right. I mean, it's just a clinical examination and uh, a couple of rel relatively uh, simple screening tests. And then if the pediatric cardiologist has any question, they can always do an echocardiogram, which is an ultrasound study. Um, but the overwhelming majority of children with innocent heart murmurs um, basically have one visit to the cardiologist and are considered to be normal and healthy. Now, years ago, those children were thought to have uh, an illness because they really didn't understand innocent heart murmurs. Right. And many children back in the 30s and 40s uh, were restricted from activities because they had a heart murmur, right, unnecessarily. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, many, many studies were done to show that children with innocent murmurs who are restricted do not do as well as their peers in physical activities and other things, even though they have nothing wrong with them. Right. Um, so we learned to be very, very careful and make sure that the parents fully understand that children with innocent murmurs do not have 
heart disease and that they don't need to worry about them. And they should have a full life. And they have a full life with no problems whatsoever. Right. Now, now, Bill, often we hear, we, we talk to some good folks, and you've mentioned about the family. What is generally meant by family in a patient-centered practice? Well, I mean, in a pediatric cardiology practice, it's very, very important to make sure that you not only treat the illness or the abnormality of the child with congenital heart disease, but the, that you also take into account the family constellation, the siblings, the parents, especially when a child has a serious problem, let's say, and is blue or gets blue when they cry. Uh, the entire family becomes focused on the newly born child with congenital heart disease um, to the extent that they um, almost disregard um, their other children, and the other children get left out and um, the family constellation is very seriously affected by the presence of heart disease in a child. Um, so we as pediatric cardiologists, from the time that I was in my training and certainly after I arrived in Pittsburgh, focused on things we could do um, to help the family deal with the problem of a child with very serious congenital heart disease, especially a child who turns blue or needs to have a cardiac catheterization or heart surgery. Right. Right. Now, I understand you initiated some programs to help families. One of them was called Heart to Heart. That's correct. When I first arrived in Pittsburgh, um, I used to connect families with newly born children with congenital heart disease, with families that had older children, let's say a nine or a ten-year-old, with the same defect. And families found this to be extraordinarily valuable to be able to see a child who had weathered the storm of the congenital heart disease and was a normal healthy kid even though they had a scar on their chest. Um, it became very difficult to do this on a one-to-one -one basis and so my social workers and I around 1975 started a parent support group at Children's Hospital in Pittsburgh called Heart to Heart whereby we um, gathered some families who had older children who were very good communicators and good listeners and we actually taught them how to be effective listeners. And basically we had regional groups all around Pittsburgh and the suburbs as well as in Altoona and Johnstown and, and uh, Beaver and Erie. Um, and the purpose of these groups was to uh, be able to connect families in their areas who had newly diagnosed children with heart disease um, with one of the heart-to-heart -heart counseling families. Right. Um, and when a child was brought to children's, a social worker would ask the parents of the newly diagnosed child if they would be willing to talk to somebody who lived in their area who had an older child with congenital heart disease and if they did then they would connect up those parents. Right. Um, we also ran uh, essentially teaching sessions in all of these areas. One of my associate, uh, one of my uh, um, social workers and I would actually go out to these communities and you know every couple of months or maybe quite twice a year and, and have a, a teaching session about heart disease, about antibiotic prophylaxis, about things like that right. for the families in that area, um, either in, in the home of one of the uh, counseling families or perhaps in a local school or a church or mm -hmm. uh, something like that. Mm -hmm. And Heart to Heart has been going on now for almost 40 years. Um, right. And it still exists. The, um, uh, the family, the regional groups don't exist anymore. Right. Um, but there are families that still come to Children's Hospital to visit families who are hospitalized right. with children with heart disease and these are all families who initially benefited when they were uh, having new children with heart disease and they want to give something back. So they've continued this program to the present day. Really? Now I understand particularly for the kids you were responsible for initiating a program of heart camps. Tell us, tell us about those. Well, you know, uh, after doing things for the families we always had the idea that maybe we should do something very special for the children. Um, I knew about a diabetic camp in New York, which has been running since the 1930s when I was a resident. Mm -hmm. um, and so my social workers and I decided that it would be a nice idea to start uh, a camp for children with heart disease. And we went around Pittsburgh and we looked at a lot of Y camps and stuff. And we came upon Camp Conakway, which is a YMCA camp in Zelianople, which is about 30 miles north of Pittsburgh. Right. And in 1991, we started our first heart camp. Uh, it runs from Tuesday to Saturday. Mm -hmm. um, the children are all um, patients of uh, um, Children's Hospital in Pittsburgh, although we have had a number of uh, groups come from other areas who then went back to their cities and started heart camps based upon our experience. Right. Now when these children 
are seen in the office, uh, all we know about them and their physical capabilities is what the parents tell us. And right. the parents would tell us these children are limited and they are disabled and they don't have the capabilities of the siblings and things like that. Um, and so the first year of Heart Camp, we went up with 32 kids and mm -hmm. we had organized all of these picnic games, things that were, don't, weren't very stressful. And we got up to Camp Conakway and they got off the bus and they said, oh, look at that baseball field, let's play baseball. And we said, no, 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 you can't do that. And so we did all of our picnic games and all of our quiet stuff and the kids kept nagging us all day. And finally the next morning after breakfast, they nagged some more and we said, okay. And we went out and we chose up two teams of 16 kids each and any child who couldn't run, um, uh, somebody ran for them. And these kids played baseball for two and a half hours. It was just an incredible eye-opener for us as, as caregivers. Right. Um, and from that point onward, uh, we basically treated these kids as normal, healthy children. So all of the activities that the YMCA camp does starting with Father's Day throughout the all entire summer. Right. Our kids do in the week before Father's Day right. uh, at Camp Conakway. Um, right. They play softball, they run, they swim. There's an obstacle course there, a you know, real obstacle course where they climb over a wall mm -hmm. and they do mm -hmm. rope swings mm -hmm. and stuff like that. And even the, the, the child who's least physica physically able um, is able to perform these activities. Right, and so if some kids are going swimming and if somebody is scarred, they see others, others are in the same situation. Older kids who've got scars are going out and doing vigorous stuff. Absolutely, I mean, scars are a big issue that these kids talk about all the time. And actually at heart camp, the only weird kid is the kid who doesn't have a scar. <laughs> um, and so uh, there are a lot of opportunities for the children start at eight years of age and go to age 14. Right. At age 14, they become junior counselors and senior counselors, and all of our uh, counselors, junior counselors, as well as our camp director, who's in his mid-50s, are patients, right. right? So these children not only have an opportunity suddenly to get to know 130 other kids like themselves at yeah. varying ages, but they also get to know a lot of young adults and adults who right. serve as tremendous role models for right. these kids. Right, right. Now, I understand that the camp has gone on, and a few years ago, they had a name change. How did that come about? Well, I mean, I started the camp in 1991, and I retired in 2005. And when I retired, I went up to the camp, you know, figuring this is the last time I'll be there the full time because I'm going to be moving away to DC. Um, and lo and behold, they had named the heart camp for me. So instead of calling it heart camp now, for the last 10 years, it's been known as the Dr. Bill Natchez Heart Camp for Kids. Isn't that nice? So that's a tremendous honor, totally unexpected. Um, and um, the, the camp continues to flourish. Uh, this was the 25th anniversary this year. There was a big celebration. So my wife and I and my daughter and my grandsons actually went to camp for the entire time. And they all had an opportunity to experience the wonderful things that occur at Heart Camp that uh, I've been experiencing for 25 years. Right. Now, Bill, when did you first come to Chautauqua? Well, we first came to Chautauqua in 1989. We mm -hmm. um, heard about Chautauqua, and of course, Pittsburgh is only less than three hours away. Um, but the kids weren't grown, and we couldn't leave them in the summertime, et cetera. So in 1989, my, one of my children were you know, finished with college, the other one was in college, and we came up for a long weekend. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, we fell in love with Chautauqua immediately. Um, the following year, we didn't come back, but the year after that, we had a week where we could a come back, and we came back, and we stayed in the Glen Park and Bester Plaza, and halfway during that week, we started looking for a condo. And in October of that year, uh, we bought a place to live um, here in Chautauqua on the grounds. And then a few years later, you bought a cottage. That's right. Um, after a couple of years, it was obvious that our um, small condo apartment wasn't adequate when the children wanted to come, if they both wanted to come together, right. let alone with spouses and families. And so we started looking, and we found a lovely house that we bought in 1995 and renovated that year. Um, and we've been there for 20 years. It's wonderful. That's a wonderful home. Now, tell me about how you've got involved with Chautauqua Property Owners. Well, you know, I'd been here a number of years, and one of the um, uh, Chautauqua Property Owners Association members, who is the area representative of my area, mm -hmm. um, approached me and asked me if I'd be willing to be the area representative. Um, we have 10 areas in Chautauqua, and each area has an area representative 
and that individual sits on the board of the Property Owners Association. <coughs> right. So I agreed to do that, and I also found that there was an outdoor lighting committee that you had served on and right. a number of other excellent people, and uh, my sister is a lighting designer in California, so I have a little bit of knowledge, not very much. Um, but I decided it would be interesting to join the lighting committee as well, um, and so I did that at the same time as I joined the Property Owners Association as the Area 7 representative. Right. Now, you've, you learned a great deal about lighting in the process. Tell me what National Grid does for us and what do they charge? Well, I mean, uh, National Grid is, is an electric company and they provide the electricity and they also own all the lighting in Chautauqua other than the lights in Bester Plaza and on the brick walk. Chautauqua Institution. In the institution that are owned by the institution itself. Right. Um, so there are about 350 or more street lights in the in Chautauqua Institution that right. are owned by National Grid. Right. Right. Now the Chautauqua Utility District pays National Grid um, about $55,000 a year, um, but only about $15,000 of that actually goes to pay for electricity. The rest of it goes to pay for leasing of the lights in Chautauqua. Right. Um, and some of those lights have been in place for many, many years and have been uh, paid for many times over. Um, so we began to, uh, uh, the lighting committee began to talk with National Grid about the possibility of the Chautauqua Utility District taking over the lighting in the Chautauqua Institution. Right. And those negotiations are still in progress, but uh, we're getting pretty close to coming to some agreement. Now, one of the things we're concerned about is the, f the, the uh, equipment, and I think there's a generation of lights with incandescent bulbs, and some say that is 70 years old. Is, is right. that correct? That's correct. And, and so it's, it looked like clear glass globes that may have been around here before World War II. Right. Who knows? They're still replacing them. Now, um, w one of the pe things people talk about with new lighting is glare. And I wonder if you'd give us what a physician's definition of glare would be. Well, I'll give you the, not only a physician's definition, but also a definition of the, the lighting design community. The International Dark Sky Association right. was founded a number of years ago, and actually Terry McGowan, who's a uh, lighting designer in Chautauqua, is one of the founding members of this organization. Right. Um, so disability glare is the inability to see things clearly as a result of lights shining in your eyes, like I have now with right. the spotlights. Right. The problem is that as you get older, the disability glare increases dramatically. So that if you're in your 30s, about you know 10 or 15 percent of your um, visibility is, uh, vision is reduced. By the time you're in your 60s or 70s, you've got 60 or 70 percent of your visibility reduced by disability glare. Right. Now I have some examples that Could I'd we like see to them? show you. Um, so. Um, we do some uh, walkabouts on Sunday night in Chautauqua at 9.30 to teach the community about disability glare. And this is one of the pictures that I show people. In the top and picture? Top frame of the picture, this is somebody's backyard. And what you're seeing is a spotlight in the backyard that illuminates the backyard fairly well. If you look in the background, there you can see that there's a fence in the background, but it's not very clear, and you really can't see anything very much. Now, if you take your hand, and in the second, the lower panel, if you take your hand and you block the, the glare from the light that's shining in your eyes, notice now you can clearly see not only the fence, but the fact that there's a door to the fence which is open, and that there's somebody standing in that doorway. Again, if you go up to the top panel and you see that with the glare, you really can't see that at all. And that's called disability glare. Now that affects you when you're also walking on the street, right? So I have another example, all right, here. And in the upper panel, we have two lights. The light on the, um, what is it, on the left-hand side of your screen, right, is the light that we've chosen with reduced glare. The light on the right-hand side of your screen is the light that has lots of glare, right? The end result is if you look at the, uh, images in the bottom of the picture, you'll notice that your visibility is reduced considerably. Look at the bottom under the, um, no, it's, uh, stay on the top, stay on the top, right? Just look at the bottom of the picture and you'll see that you can see the boards very, very clearly, right? 
in the left-hand panel, and the boards are in shadow and are very poorly vis visible in the right-hand panel. And both of these are the same light with the same light output, but one has glare and the other one does not. Another example, a, a serious example of glare, if you go to the bottom panel, right? Um, the bottom panel shows the visibility from a car, right? Notice through the windshield, you've got disabling glare that basically um, blocks out your visibility. And notice as soon as the glare is removed that you can actually see there are pedestrians in front of the car, right? So disability glare is a serious problem. Um, it occurs not only when you're driving your car at night, if the street lights are very bright and shining in your eyes, you have reduced visibility so you can't see pedestrians, but even when you're walking. So for example, if you're walking on a street like we have in Chautauqua Institution, uh, for example, in Bester Plaza, where we have globes that have 100 watt bulb equivalents in them, right? even though they're very pleasing looking and they don't appear to be too bright, they are reducing your visibility by a significant amount so that you are unable to s properly see on the ground the impediments in front of you that you might very well trip on. So disability glare is a serious problem and in Chautauqua we are on a mission all right, to try to replace lights that have a minimum of glare that are dark sky friendly so none of the light shines up into the sky, it shines down on the ground and also don't result in light trespass, which means the light on the street shining in the windows at night, so that instead of having light on the ground, you're having light in your bedroom, or light on your porch, or light in your living room. This unwanted light is called light trespass, and the lights that we have recommended putting in in Chautauqua now um, do not have light trespass. Almost all the light that these lights have goes on to the ground. So a good light that has, has that plane of, that simply forms on the surface you're walking and doesn't, doesn't rise much above it. That's correct. And if I can show you this um, picture, um, if you focus on the top picture on the left-hand side of your screen is a picture of the light that we are now recommending the institution install. Um, this is a light that basically um, has a LED bulb in it or an LED uh, uh, light source, um, and this light shines all the light on the ground. On the right-hand side, you can see a picture at night of the distribution of this light, and you'll notice that the light shines on the ground and on the street. By the time you get to the opposite side of the street, which you can't see in this picture, um, there's no uh, light trespass, so that the house that's on the corner, directly opposite the light, does not have light trespass in their windows. And the bottom part of the, um, the page, uh, you'll see um, on the left-hand side a close-up picture of the light itself, and on the right-hand side of your screen, you can actually see the light source. Most LED light sources are these little bright white dots that blind you when you're trying to um, see, especially the new LED flashlights and most of the LED lights that are used in street lights. This is a special light module made by Philips. Mm -hmm. um, and this light module is the bright area in the center of the light, um, which is a, uh, on this picture a little bit orange in color, but it's a normal natural color. It's actually the same color uh, as incandescent light bulb. Okay. Right? This is a light, light that uses 26 watts. Okay. And this light is the light that illuminated that entire street in the upper panel. Really? So this light has still a little bit of glare. You can't get rid of glare completely. Right. But this light has uh, a much smaller amount of glare than any other light that we have tried. And we tried four different types of LED lights that were recommended by our um, uh, lighting design group right, um, two summers ago. And this turned out to be the best of the lot. And we have now installed this light uh, on upper route um, last summer, there are three of them there, and these lights are going in down by the lakeside after the summer right. uh, on a new brick walk that's been installed down there. Right. Now, was there anything particularly about the lens design that you come across that, that people might be aware of? 
Well, the, the lights usually come with a lens, right? and we wanted to reduce the glare, so we asked the company to give us a prismatic lens, which reduces the glare, right? but unfortunately it also reduced the light output. Mm -hmm. um, and so the company actually went back to the drawing board, and this company has designed a new lens, which is also glare reduction lens, but it does not reduce the light output so that this light now can be certified by the Design Light Consortium, which is the group in the United States that certifies um, lighting um, that is used for public use. Right, right. Now, w we have one short street, I guess, upper route that has new lighting in, and there's a couple of things on Pratt. Do you see any, any bigger uh, changes coming at the institution and lighting in the next year or so? Well, we have been working with the Department of Energy and uh, we have done a study of the uh, outdoor lighting and the the study that we did two years ago looking at the four different LED lights right. right, has actually been published by the Department of Energy in a document called pedestrian friendly um, street lighting. Wonderful. Um, and basically half of that project was done here in Chautauqua and the other half of the project was actually done by my sister who is a lighting designer at Stanford right. and who is redoing the, the outdoor lighting on the Stanford campus and is using similar uh, kinds of lights. Um, this document is actually available um, on the Department of Energy website and we have a project as soon as we can come to some agreement with National Grid to replace the 10 lights that currently exist on Pratt Avenue between Ramble and Hearst in mm -hmm. Chautauqua with these uh, LED lights and to do all of the necessary um, testing that lighting designers do both before and after um, to see what uh, the quality of light is. Right. The existing lights are all mercury vapor lights would have to be replaced when they burn out. Right. The whole lighting fixture does because right. they can't be used anymore. And they are 100 watt lights and we're going to replace them with a 26 watt light. And that's progress. Which gives more light and is not glare, right? And shines on the ground and does not have light trespass. And so, but the bulbs last longer too. And the bulbs have an expected life of between 15 and 20 years. That's terrific. That's terrific. Now, Bill, with your good work on lighting, you were elected president of Chautauqua Property Owners Association last summer. I wonder if you could tell us a few words about uh, CPOA and what your plans are for the next year. Well, the mission of the Chautauqua Property Owners Association is to continue and to enhance uh, the ambiance and the quality of life on the grounds of Chautauqua for everybody who's there, not just property owners right. but visitors. Right. So we have a number of initiatives. The lighting uh, issue, uh, uh, the lighting design stuff is one initiative. Uh, we have a transportation and safety committee um, that has been very active uh, in the last few years. Um, we also uh, uh, designed the, the shared space, space initiative in Chautauqua, um, which basically tries to remind Chautauquans to be considerate of our neighbors and to um, have um, a quiet dialogue and to discuss our differences calmly and quietly. The Transportation and Safety Committee this year is holding a bicycle rodeo in the beginning of July for children right. on July 5th and July 12th and July 19th where we will teach them about bicycle safety, teach them about um, pedestrian bicycle and scooter bicycle interaction, um, show them the best routes to use to take to go down a club and also give them lots of goodies including a bracelet that said says um, uh, bicycles are cool, but pedestrians rule. Um, <laughs> and we also are sponsoring an initiative to try to get um, the adults in the community to wear bicycle helmets. Right. Right? I mean, children are mandated to wear bicycle helmets until age 14 by law in the state of New York. But the fact is that bicycles are very, very safe uh, devices to be on, especially when you're wearing a helmet. And you can have very, very serious and life-threatening problems even if you accidentally hit a pebble and fall off your bicycle. Right. So we are on a mission to try to convince Chautauquans to wear bicycle helmets and actually um, we probably will have uh, little spots in the paper um, with uh, things saying, you know, wear your helmet 
Um, and actually, the Billy Schmidt at the Chautauqua Cinema uh, may be actually putting up some spots for us uh, during the before the movie right. um, uh, uh, things that go on there uh, to convince people to uh, practice bicycle safety and wear bicycle helmets. Right. And I know in our closing moment here, you. Uh, gave me the very nice lecture last summer saying, where's your helmet, big boy? And then uh, I'm feeling guilty coming back without one, but I will have one before the end of the season. That's right. Well, so, I'm very so proud that so all of my friends me. have agreed to wear bicycle helmets. You can check me out. I'm thinking I need to buy one that fits, and there's another one in our garage in North Carolina. The bicycle is up here, so that one ought to come by and, and be something for guests. Absolutely. It'll, it'll be great to see you riding your bicycle with a helmet. <laughs> you will before <laughs> too long. I've been caught. I've been busted. <laughs> Bill, this has been great fun, and I'm glad that you could be here on Chautauqua. People is our first guest of the season. Um, everyone, thank you for viewing, and um, again, um, please come back. <laughs>